Nothing will benefit human health or increase the chances for survival on life on earth is the evolution to a vegetarian diet. I love this quote, I just love it because it came from possibly the smartest man to ever live. It really is a great summary of what are those key things we can do to make a difference and one of them is a vegetarian. A vegetarian diet can prevent 97% of our coronary occlusions, by the way that means heart problems for those that don't understand. Who said that? Well it was an American Medical Association editorial in 1961. And I love this because this is actually mainstream American doctors talking about this. And this is 50 years ago that this was said. And of course, it doesn't, hasn't become a mainstay part of what we get given advice on when it comes to heart disease. However, we know that it works. And we'll go into that in some detail tonight. How long since I ate meat? Can you do it? Can you actually get along without eating meat? Yes, about 26 years actually since I ate any meat. So it's been a long time for me. And that's something people ask me about. How can you get by without meat, without the protein? Well, you know. A long time, if you really want it. A long, long time. I've done it since I was 18 years old. So, How did we go from knowing that the best athletes in the ancient Greek Olympics must consume a plant-based diet to fearing that vegetarians don't get enough protein? From T. Colin Campbell. And again, it's a really good question because we have this whole illusion of if we don't eat meat every day, we haven't got enough protein. It's completely incorrect, as we talk through in the protein seminar. Um, but we have this kind of fear about that now, whereas historically, athletes would give up meat before they did any training. So again, an interesting question. My father and both grandfathers ate a typical American high meat diet and each died at the age of 57. Only my uncle, who became a vegetarian after his first heart bypass, smart man, lived to see his 84th birthday. On my mother's side, all the men were heavy meat eaters and all died of heart attacks in their 40s. There was never a connection made between diet, heart disease and mortality by anyone but my uncle and me. It's from Dr. Gabriel Cousins. And it really is, tells a really, really clear picture about heart disease and eating meat. So is eating more plants weird? That's another question we get a lot. Is eating more plants weird? Well, the question more is, what about being cut open with a saw and having heart surgery? Is that what you consider more weird than eating more plants? Mm -hmm. What about losing your hair and your immune system due to cancer treatment? Is that more weird? What about going blind or losing your arms and legs to diabetes? Is that more weird than eating more plants? What about not being able to fit on an airplane seat due to being obese? Is that more weird? What about not being able to remember the faces of your grandchildren when you're a grandparent? I would consider that to be really weird and heartbreaking as well. So what about suddenly dying in your 40s from a surprise heart attack? And I've known people that this has happened to. And, you know, is that considered weird? I would consider that more weird than eating more vegetables. So when you start to look at, if people say, is eating more plants weird? Well, no, it's not weird, actually. It's life-saving and it's life-altering. So is it weird? No. And how much meat are we eating as a country now? If we look at the West, we're eating one of the highest amounts of meat in the world. Now, we're eating more meat now than we ever have in history. In 2012, the average Kiwi eats per year, hold on to your hats, because this is going to floor you, 40 kilograms of chicken, 27 kilograms of beef, 16.5 kilograms of pork, 9.7 kilograms of lamb, and 6.9 kilograms of mutton per person per year in New Zealand. Now this is 10 times the chicken that we ate in the 1960s, 10 times more. It's three times the East Asian meat average, where of course they have lower levels of heart disease and cancer and diabetes and obesity and all these things that we're getting. And it's 40 times lower, or rather 40 times higher than the Bangladesh meat average, where bowel cancer is almost non-existent. And we'll go into bowel cancer in meat in the connection as we go tonight as well. So are we eating a lot of meat? We're eating an enormous amount. We're eating about 500% more meat than we were 100 years ago. And from 1850 to 1974, there was a huge increase in meat consumption. And then we doubled our meat intake again. So from 1974, we went from about 45 kilos a year to about 100 kilos a year. And all fatal yet preventable modern diseases have all grown exponentially along with our massive increase in meat intake. In China alone, there's been a 15-fold increase in meat consumption. And of course, they now have more diabetics on planet Earth than any other country in the world. So it's extraordinary what's happening around the world when it comes to meat consumption and disease rates. Norway was an interesting one. If you look at Norway during World War II, there was a forced study that happened during the Second World War. And what happened was the death rates in Norway from circulatory heart disease had been climbing steadily since the 1920s, so going up for a long period of time. And then in 1940, when the Nazis invaded, 
they actually took all the animals away to feed the army. So they removed all the animals from Norway that were being bred. And immediately Norway was forced onto a plant-based whole food diet. What happened to the heart disease rates when they suddenly had all the animals removed forcibly? Well, they dropped about 40% over the preceding couple of years until they got their animals back. So interestingly, when World War II ended, Norway got their cows back and heart disease has risen ever since. And this slide from Forks and Knives shows you exactly what happened. And when you have a look at this slide, started off in 1927, we start to rise, heart disease going up, animal intake going up, rising, rising. As soon as the animals are removed, bang, heart disease almost instantly stops. And in 1945, 1944, when they got their animals back, heart disease started to rise again, and it's been rising ever since. So it's fascinating when you start to look at the different countries and what they've been eating over history. Can you reverse heart disease through diet? Yes, you can. It's been done many times. Dr. Dean Ornish put 28 heart disease patients onto a plant-based whole food diet, and he managed their stress uh, and their exercise as well. And he also monitored 20 patients on the usual diet and the usual medications. So the 20 patients on the standard advice and the standard medications actually had a 162% rise in the frequency of chest pain. And artery blockages increased in size. So the standard medication and the standard dietary advice actually gave them more heart disease. So then he looked at the 28 patients on the plant-based whole food diet. They had a 91% reduction in the frequency of chest pain as opposed to a 162% increase. They had diminished blockages in their arteries. They had drastically lowered cholesterol levels. And over 82% had regression in their heart disease. So basically the polar opposite picture, when as soon as you start putting people onto a heart-based, uh, plant-based whole food diet with heart disease, you start to notice that the uh, disease starts to go backwards. There's another heart study done, the same result, where they took 100 uh, heart attack survivors were studied. 50 of them ate the modern low-fiber animal-rich diet, and 50 ate a high-fiber plant-based whole food diet. After 12 years, 0% on the animal-rich diet were alive, which is zero people out of 50. But 40% on the plant-based diet were still alive, which is 20 out of 50, which is an enormous difference. Generally, when you're doing a scientific experiment, if you get a 2 to 5% result, that's considered a huge success. So when you get something like a 40% success rate, that is considered completely and utterly off the chart and extraordinary. So does it work well? Yes. So what it told us what was people eating a plant-based whole food diet die at a rate four times lower than those on the modern animal-rich diet. And of course, all these studies are peer-reviewed. Heart disease completely cured. 18 people with severe heart disease had suffered through about 50 coronary events. So these were people that were literally dying of heart disease. Anginas, bypass surgery, strokes, literally being told, look, you will be dead within months. One particular woman, I saw an interview with her, and she was told within three months that she'll be dead. This woman was told that it's all over. Now, they were put onto a plant-based whole food diet with minimal medication, and the results were that from then on, from the moment on that they were put on a plant-based whole food diet, every single person in the study had zero coronary events of any sort, zero heart attacks, zero strokes, zero bypass operations, and zero angina. So these are people that effectively were told they were going to die, immediately and utterly stopped their heart disease. It stopped for all participants. It was reversed the damage in all patients. 70% had an opening of clogged arteries where they were told they would never be opening again. And 17 years later, all were alive in their 70s and 80s. And this dietary study is without peer the most successful treatment of heart disease ever recorded in history. It's a 100% hit rate, curing heart disease, reversing artery damage, and promoting healthy life for decades. By the way, most of these people are still alive today. And you can see their interviews. So very interesting. And this is just through a plant-based whole food diet, managing their stress, bit of exercise. Very simple stuff. So you really start to see how heart disease is a foodborne illness. So if you look at heart disease in populations as well, the death rate from coronary heart disease is 17 times higher among Western men like us, eating the typical animal-rich modern diet, than it is amongst rural Chinese men eating a plant-based whole food diet. In the three-year Chinese study of over 400,000 people, this is almost half a million people, eating a plant-based whole food diet in China, there was not one person, not one single person in 400,000 who died of heart disease before the age of 64. Not one person out of 400,000. It's extraordinary when you start to think of the fact that in New Zealand, in Australia, in the UK and America, four out of every 10 of us will die from heart disease. So it's 40 to 42% in Western countries, whereas in places like this, it's almost non-existent, all through diet. We are giving incomplete risk information. The majority of adults who are considered low risk for cardiovascular disease are actually at high risk across their remaining lifespan. 
And what that's talking about is when you look at heart disease, you need to look at the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You don't look at, am I going to die of heart disease in the next two weeks? So it's a longer term approach because heart disease grows over time in the human body. So this study that was done by the University Feinberg School of Medicine, by 2012 they'd followed about a quarter of a million people for 50 years. And they're people in our kind of age group, 45 to 75, for about 50 years. And they found that 45-year-old men eating the modern diet had about a 36% chance of dying of heart disease and stroke. So it's a one in three. So you see the typical man has got about a one in three chance of dying of stroke. Now, if you add in that these men were smoking or they had high cholesterol, which we know comes from meat, or high blood sugar, or high blood pressure problems, which we know also is a direct fallout of animal foods, your risk jumps to 50%. That's one in two. That's why the typical Kiwi male aged 45 has a one in two chance of a heart attack at any one time. Now, if you look at, again, the results of the study, they found that 45-year-old men who are non-smoking, eating a healthy diet with healthy blood pressure, low or healthy cholesterol levels and low or healthy blood sugar levels had less than 1% chance of a heart disease or stroke. Now remember, this is a quarter of a million people followed for 50 years. So this is an extraordinarily in-depth study of people living life out in the world. It's not a study done in a clinical environment. This is actually people in the world. So if you look at the 1 in 3 chance of a heart attack or 1 in 2 chance of a heart attack or 1 in 100 chance of a heart attack, you start to see how dramatically you can change your risk of heart disease, which is the biggest killer. And the biggest link, of course, with heart disease is meat. How do we know that? Well, we know that heart disease is a foodborne illness. And this is Dean Ornish, professor of medicine, University of California. I love this quote because he sums it up so simply. And we never talk about heart disease as being a foodborne illness, but that's what it is. We lose nearly 20% of our healthy years of life to heart disease. 20% of our life. Erectile dysfunction is the first indicator of cardiovascular disease, so that's something for men to watch out for. Key things with men with uh, cardiovascular disease is watching for uh, erectile dysfunction or big red nose, uh, shortness of breath, high levels of stress, uh, pain in the chest, things like that. But in 25% of cases with heart disease, sudden death is the first and only sign. So the very first time you know about it, you die. So that's the only symptom that you get. So in one in four cases, that's a lot. For most heart attack victims, diet alone would work if we advocated diet in American medicine, but we don't. I'll read that again because it's quite an amazing thing considering it came from Dr. William P. Castelli, who's the medical director of the most respected long-term heart study done in history, which is the Framington Heart Study, started in 1984, still going today. Now, the medical director, the top dog, talking about this, says for most heart attack victims, diet alone would work. And this is, comes from the guy who's been studying heart disease for longer than most people on the planet, if we advocated diet, but we don't. So that alone, again, tells you an enormous amount about heart disease from people who look at it. Now, we know that 95% of people in the West are regular meat eaters. In some countries like America, it's, it's about 99% of people eat meat. So we're told that you need to eat meat to get your essential fatty acids, your vitamin D, your vitamin K, and your vitamin A nutrients. But studies show that about 70% of people in the West are deficient in essential fatty acids, vitamin D, vitamin K, and vitamin A. So the very things we've been told to eat meat for, most of us are actually deficient in. So if meat is the answer, then why are people so nutritionally deficient? And of course that comes down to gut health and bowel health, of course, which meat has an extraordinarily negative effect on. So meat contains zero antioxidants, zero vitamin C, zero fiber, zero complex carbohydrates, an enormous amount of trans fats. It's the only natural food in nature at all that contains any trans fats. Massive amounts of cholesterol and saturated fats, hard to absorb calcium, iron, and protein. I know people in my own life that have iron problems even though they eat an enormous amount of meat and B12 problems even though they eat an enormous amount of meat. It's very, very rife in Western world. It leaves an acidic residue, contains AGEs, PAH, HCAs, FIP, antibiotics, and hormones, and we will explain all those terms as we go tonight. Uh, and 95% of your pesticide and uh, herbicide residue comes from meat and dairy products, animal foods. So meat contains these things, which is basically not a lot of anything good. The vegetarian human being. So if we have a comparison with the vegetarian human being and we look through history, because a lot of the time we're told hunters and gatherers are how we evolved, we used to chase meat down and that's what we grow on and that's how our brain developed. Well, if you actually have a look at the reality, it's not actually that true. The traditional view is that we're eating meat, we're hunter gatherers. However, as humans migrated from the rainforest, what we lived on was a prebiotic, fiber, antioxidant, nutrient-rich diet which again is what we talk about on the program. It's that kind of rich diet full of antioxidants, fruits, vegetables, what we used to call subsurface tumors and rhizomes and corms and 
perennial bulbs and stems and nuts and seeds, a lot of which, of course, we call now vegetables or vegetation. And archaeologists examining Italy, Russia, and the Czech Republic sites from about 30,000 years ago found that the food residues were mainly plants. So this is where the humans actually were living and dying. Most of what they were eating were actually plants. The caveman and Neanderthal vegetarian. Scientific investigators studying Neanderthal men and Neanderthal cultures had confirmed that a wide variety of plant materials were being eaten. And when you think about it logically, you would actually eat what kept you alive back then. You would eat what kept you alive. You wouldn't actually go looking for something to make you sick because, of course, then you only had the experience of people in the culture around you. We didn't have the kind of studies we have today. So it's very simple when you think about it. And the genes, of course, are about 99% identical to what we have now, so there hasn't been a huge change in the gene pool. And they had virtually zero incidence of modern lifestyle diseases. So when you look back, you don't see people dying of heart disease. And in all likelihood, much like chimpanzees, which we are 99.4% identical to, they had a diet based on fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, uh, legumes and grains and things like that, and very rarely meat if they managed to catch one. And that would be ceremonial then. They'd have a great time. They'd create a fire and cook it up and it would be wonderful. But it was generally for ceremonial occasions or special occasions when it happened. Gladiators, for example, the toughest group of people ever lived, were vegetarian. The extraordinary strength of the world's fiercest warriors you literally had to fight to stay alive was from plants. How do we know that? Well, the remains of 60 Roman gladiators who fought and died 1,800 years ago in western Turkey were analysed. And an isotopic analysis of their bones for minerals showed the calcium, strontium and zinc confirmed they were 100% vegetarian slash vegan, these gladiators. Historically, they were referred to as Hodari, or Bali men, uh, due to the Bali they lived on. And funnily enough, uh, the number one ranked uh, mixed martial artist on the planet right now, Mac Denzig, is 100% plant-based, has been for seven years, completely vegan. And this guy is made of stone, and he's unbeatable by all the other guys that come into the ring, which is the kind of ring where anything goes, that kind of fighting, <laughs> you know, no rules, just get in the ring and survive. And this guy's been a vegan for seven years, and he's unbeaten. So, interesting. So what about wild organic meat? This is often talked about, well, that must be better quality. No question it is, absolutely. If you can get wild organic meat, is it better for you than meat that's been processed? Of course. However, the Eskimos and the Laplanders, the Kenyan Maasai, the Inuit Greenlanders, and the Russian Kyrgyz tribes eat the most meat in the world. The meat they eat is that wild, rare, hunted meat. So it's, you know, clean meat, as you call it. And they have the lowest life expectancy on the planet, often dying when they're 30 years old. The Maasai eat a diet high in wild, hunted, fresh meat, and they have the worst life expectancy in the modern world of just 45 years for women and 42 years for men. That would mean I'd be dead, and so would Tracy, if we lived in this kind of diet. So interesting when you look at it. The Maasai really live beyond age 60. So when we're looking at, well, longevity champions around the world are living into their 110s, 115s. That's a very different longevity stat than living till in your 60s. The world's oldest vegetarians, uh, the world's oldest centenarians are vegetarians. Uh, Sardinians, of course, we've talked about. Over the years, Okanawas, we've talked about. Loma Linda, uh, the group of Seventh-day Adventists in California, which have got the longest, uh, highest rates of longevity in America. Funnily enough, in Loma Linda, strict vegetarians, they have 10 times more centenarians than any other group in America, than the average across America. So if you're going to live to 100, you've got 10 times more chance living in Loma Linda. Now, what do they not eat more than anything? Meat. So even in America, in the middle of that country, Pakistanis, the Hunza is the same, Costa Ricans, and these are the world champion centenarians around the world, and they often eat less meat in a week than we do in a day. Now, some of these cultures do eat meat, but what they're eating is in such small amounts on ceremonial occasions, like a Sunday afternoon dinner or when the tribes get together, and that's the difference. What we're lost is that moderation, where we tend to bring foods in all day long, and we eat meat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They don't do that. They save it for Sunday afternoon, much like they save their alcohol for Sunday afternoon as well, or Saturday night, you know. Southern Italians as well, one of the longest lived peoples in the world. They traditionally eat a lot of plants and leafy green vegetables, and they eat meat just barely once a month. So when you start to look at the world's oldest people, they're eating far less meat, and the people that die the youngest are eating far more meat. So you start to get more of a picture when you look at it from that perspective. Even the world's oldest people on the planet, the oldest human being to ever live was a vegetarian. The oldest man ever to live, a vegetarian, Christian Mortensen. The oldest woman right now. The third oldest person alive on the planet today is vegetarian. The oldest woman in China, currently a vegetarian. The oldest men in India and Sri Lanka right now are vegetarians. The oldest men in Denmark and Britain are vegetarians. The oldest marathon runner, Francis Singh, who I often blog about, is an amazing guy, just ran the, uh, the UK uh, London marathon for the last time at 101, pure vegetarian. 
the world's biggest bodybuilder, Bill Pearl, vegetarian for 20 years. And this guy's got more muscle mass on him than just about anyone. Uh, they all ate plant-based whole food diets. So very interesting when you look at how do you live a long, healthy life. Do I eat a lot of meat? Maybe not. So vegetarian super centenarians. Then you get into those people that live between 110 and 120. And my favorite name to super centenarian, 108-year-old Lauren Dinwiddie, wonderful name, has only eaten fruits, nuts, and vegetables since 1922. That's all she's eaten for 89 years. Of course, it's even more now. Joel Rolino, world's strongest man and a model for longevity and health. Amazing guy. Exercised every day. He could still bend quarters with his finger at age 104. Full vegetarian. Sadly, he died from being hit by a car. He didn't die of old age. He died last year when he was hit by a car. So he was in great health. Marge Jetton lived to age 106. On a typical morning, she walked a mile, lifted weights <laughs> at 106, and ate her oats. She loved her porridge every day. And of course, as you know, I'm a huge fan of porridge and oats. I haven't eaten meat in 50 years, she said on her 101st birthday when she was interviewed, tapping her perfect teeth. They are all mine, my teeth. Every single tooth she had in her mouth. 109-year-old uh, record holder tells her longevity secret, do not get carried away with meat dishes. And my granny Amy as well, so I've had experience of people living a long, healthy life without meat. She gave up meat in the last 81 years of her life. She didn't have a single piece of meat. In fact, she didn't have anything apart from a little bit of cow's milk and her tea. That was the only animal product she lived. <coughs> lived a long, healthy life, died without disease or drugs. So there's a lot of super centenarians, even the oldest, healthy, healthiest people, la, la, healthiest people on the planet, <laughs> live long, healthy lives. This is a fascinating one. I'm going to read this out from Dr. Gabriel Cousins. Longevity arguments are complicated, and the best we can do is to make epidemiological statements which strongly suggest that those with the greatest longevity primarily, if not entirely, have plant source only in their diet. The inner circle of Essenes, when most of the population's lifespan at that time was 40 to 50 years, had an average lifespan of 120 years. There was at least one anthropological finding of 3.2 million years ago showing that the basic diet of the people at that time was similar to the chimpanzees' diet, which is about 98% plant source. The Hunza cuts, well known for their longevity, are generally considered to be primarily vegetarian, except for the ceremonial use of meat. There was a certain tribe of Yermanites who were vegetarian and long-lived. One study done in Russia on the 21,000 centenarians found the highest percentage were vegetarians. Another study in Bulgaria showed 1,600 centenarians for every million of its population, compared to nine centenarians per million in the US. That's extraordinary, 1,600 versus nine. The vast majority of these Bulgar Bulgarian centenarians were lacto-vegetarians, meaning no meat, but occasionally some dairy products or eggs. The tribes in the Vilcambama region of Ecuador, the Mayans, the Tarahumaras of Mexico, all known for their longevity and are primarily plant source only societies. All of these studies suggest that vegetarian cultures tend to live longer. That's from Dr. Gabriel Cousins from 2011. And it's a really interesting overview as well. I started as a meat loving dairy farmer as a scientist. I used to lament the views of vegetarians as I taught nutritional biochemistry to pre-med students. My only interest now is to explain the scientific basis for my views in the clearest way possible from legitimate research findings. In short, it's about the multiple health benefits of consuming plant-based foods and the largely unappreciated health dangers of consuming animal-based foods. The vast majority of cancers, heart diseases and other forms of degenerative illness, degenerative illness can be prevented simply by adopting a plant-based diet. From T. Colin Campbell, former senior science advisor to the American Institute for Cancer Research, author of the China study, which I know many of you will have read. So interesting, even the people that start out as farmers end up over time realizing maybe something's not quite right. So the evidence suggests that we should be vegetarian. We are primates, for an example, chimpanzees and gorillas are the same, completely vegetarian. We have neither claws nor fangs, nor the speed to run down prey. Anyone here ever run down a deer and caught it? No? Okay. Anyone run down a chicken and caught it? Very hard to do. Yeah. Comparative anatomy clearly shows that humans are designed as herbivores. Our digestive system, our colon, and the number of teeth we have are identical to orangutans. In fact, we're 97% identical to orangutans and 99.4% identical to vegetarian chimpanzees. Even the protein content of human breast milk is almost identical to that of vegan vegetarian mo monkeys, but five times less than carnivores such as dogs, cats, and wolves. It's why we don't get wolf, meat, uh, wolf, wolf uh, breast milk and start drinking that if we run out of human breast milk. So human digestive systems are 10 times more alkaline than carnivores, 
and many people cannot even digest meat because of a deficiency of pancreatic enzymes. And when you talk about enzymes, over 90% of human digestive enzymes are carbohydrate digesting. So if the human body actually creates 97% of its digestive enzyme activity based around <coughs> carbohydrate digestion, that alone tells you something. It tells you that we're designed to be eating a lot more plants. And of course, when we talk about carbohydrates, we're talking about plants, whole foods, not sugar-rich foods. So many of the fastest and strongest animals in the world, the buffalo, the elephant, the great apes, built their bodies on the chlorophyll-rich proteins in grass. And of course, it's the same old thing. What are the one thing, what's the one food that all carniv carnivorous animals around the world eat when they get sick? What do they eat? They eat grass. They stop eating anything else and they eat grass because they know that's the one thing that will get them well. Chlorophyll-rich proteins. So what we've got up here now is I've done a, a chart on human anatomy and physiology. So we'll have a look at the chart based on what is it that we have and what is it that you can compare it with with herbivores, humans, and carnivores. So the anatomy. If you've got a face, we've got a big face with a small mouth, herbivores and humans, whereas carnivores have got a small mouth, a small face with a large mouth, if you look at a cat or a dog or a, a tiger or a lion. Teeth, we've got broad, flattened, and wide, whereas carnivores have short, sharp, pointed fangs. Our saliva is carbohydrate enzyme-based, whereas there's no digestive enzymes at all with carnivores in the mouth. Chewing, we have to have extensive chewing, with, if you're a herbivore or a human, whereas with uh, carnivores, of course, they swallow the meat whole and it sits in the digestion where it gets broken down by the protein-heavy digestive enzymes. Our nails are flattened or blunt, whereas the sharp claws in carnivores. Our stomach pH is about pH 4 with food, like herbivores, whereas pH 1 in a carnivore's stomach. Our stomach capacity is less than 30% of our entire digestive tract, whereas 60 to 70% here with carnivores. We've got a small intestine, which is 10 to 20 times the body length, it's only three to six times the body length with, with carnivores. Our colon is long and very complicated, goes through these long winding things, whereas simple and short and smooth in carnivores. Our liver cannot detoxify vitamin A, which is why if you have too much vitamin A, you'll get toxic. Fat soluble will get stuck in there, it's a problem. Whereas it can to detoxify vitamin A if you're a carnivore. Now what is meat very rich in? Vitamin A. Kidneys, immediately uh, moderate co uh, concentrated urine. We have moderate concentrated urine, so do herbivores, and extremely concentrated urine, as you'll find with carnivores. So it's interesting when you start to look at what are those comparative comparisons between us and other animals. So let's get into the bad news about eating meat, if you choose to eat meat. The high levels of appendicitis, of heart disease, colitis, diverticulitis, osteoporosis, and cancers, particularly stomach and bowel cancer, and we'll get into bowel cancer, there's really bad news about bowel cancer a bit later on, is directly related to meat consumption. Meat eaters visit the doctor and hospital twice as regularly as vegetarians. We have an interesting case where we have a man in the program who was in the program, the first program we did in Auckland uh, for 12 months last year. And he came onto the program simply because he'd been having antibiotics every year for 30 years. Every year he got sick and he got a colds and coughs. And for 30 years, literally every single year, he's had antibiotics, colds and coughs. Now the very first year he got onto uh, eating better and he got onto the program and started eating really well. Uh, this last 12 months was the very first time in his adult life that he hasn't had antibiotics in winter and he hasn't had a cold or a flu. First, year, first time in 30 years. It's the very first year he hasn't eaten animal products. Complete dramatic rebuild of his immune system. Didn't get sick. So I've actually seen it with people, myself included. Meat eaters visit the doctor and hospital twice as regularly. Meat eaters suffer de degenerative disease 10 years earlier than vegetarians. And you can look at this as well when you see the centenarian studies and you look at the Loma Linda population. You've got Loma Linda there and you've got San Bernardino right next door in America. Now Loma Lindas live 10 to 15 to 20 years longer than their neighbours in San Bernardino. Now funny enough in Loma Linda, of course, they don't eat any meat. Very, very high levels of vegetarian because of their faith and their religion. Then you look at the next uh, province over, which is San Bernardino, and that's where Taco Bell and McDonald's was formed. That's where they were born. So you've got these two completely differing philosophies on life. One is living far longer with the lowest levels of heart disease and cancer in the whole of America, and the other ones are the record holders. So very interesting when you look at the amount of meat and things, and of course alcohol and all these other things play into that as well. So meat processing and cooking. New Zealand farming gives us about 80,000 kilograms of antibiotics every year put onto the animal foods. Hormone-grown replacements are still used in areas of New Zealand, even though they've been banned by the European Union since 1988. And I've had that confirmed to me by farmers in the country who are in the program. The rancid starch and most commercial fried chicken batter, you know who I'm talking about when we talk about fried chicken batter. White flour, white sugar, salt, black pepper, and monosodium glutamate, or MSG. And fried starches create um, 
acrylamides, which raise kidney rinse, uh, cancer risk by 59%, ovarian cancer by 122%, and endometrial cancer by up to 99%. These are all created by the starches that are fried wrapped around the chicken, let alone what the chicken does. So when you really look at frying foods like chicken and adding fried starches to them, that is the deadly toxic bomb. And of course, that's your hamburger, your sausage, your pizza, or your fried chicken. That's the mixture that really is the deadly ones out of all of them. For instance, did you know the Environmental Protect Protection Agency estimates that about 95% of the pesticide residue in the modern diet comes from animal products alone? Most of the food pathogens that cause the medical care and the long-term health problems, or deaths of course, are Campylobacter, which is in poultry, Toxoplasma, which is in pork, and Listeria, which is in deli meats. So they're found only in those different areas. So where we get the diseases from in terms of the uh, uh, bacterial diseases that kill us, of course, they happen in animal products alone. So it's very interesting. So looking at meat protein comparison. So if we compare, what is the quality of meat proteins? Because we, we get told this a lot with meat. We need to eat our meat for our protein. That's the key thing, right? And your B12 and things like that. So meat proteins are acidic. They have zero fiber. They're combined, so they need to be broken apart by the human body when they're absorbed. They're cooked, which means that 50% of them, of course, are dead. It's how you kill your proteins. Zero vitamin C, zero antioxidants, very high in saturated fat, and zero prebiotics and zero chlorophyll. So these are key things that we need. So if you look at plant proteins, it's the opposite. They're alkaline on the body, they're high fiber, they're separated so the body can use them much more easily and distinguish them through the body. Uh, sorry, uh, spread them through the body. They're raw, you can eat them raw. High vitamin C levels, rich in antioxidants, zero saturated fat, high prebiotics. Of course, prebiotics are what give us our healthy gut and give our coughs and flus away as the prebiotic rich foods to feed your gut bacteria. And high in chlorophyll. So there's a direct comparison there between meat proteins and plant proteins. And the same thing happens when you compare it in terms of what it does to the body. And I love this quote from a molecular geneticist from John Hopkins Medicine. And uh, he says, disease often has to do with producing the right amount of protein at the right place at the right time. Changing the amount of protein will create disease. Just as changing the sort of protein that you eat will create disease. So animal proteins are corrosive on body organs as opposed to protective. They feed bowel cancer, particularly bowel cancer, directly related to animal food intake. Prevent bowel cancer, increase your blood cholesterol, plant proteins decrease it. Uh, increase your blood pressure, plant proteins decrease it. Increase IGF-1, which is a carcinogen, decrease it. So on and on it goes, and liver cancer as well. So the things that we know increase the diseases. The direct opposite happens when you're eating plant proteins. So folates versus homocysteine. And again, I did a, uh, a blog on this recently on folic acid and the difference between folic acid and folate. Folates are the natural plants, uh, parts of the B vitamin family that are in foliage. And that's where the name comes from, folate, foliage. And folic acid, it's all from that same name. So if you want to know where you get your B vitamins and fol folates from, it's from foliage. And when you think about foliage, of course, it's the large leafy green vegetables. That's what foliage is. So we know that it's only found in leafy green vegetables. And low levels of folate gives you about a three times higher risk of Alzheimer's. We know that. So we know the less green vegetables that you eat, the higher your risk of Alzheimer's. We also know that low levels of folate give you a much higher risk of hearing loss. So as you're getting older and your hearing starts to go and your brain starts to fall apart, we know they are related to green vegetable intake. So if we then look at homocysteine, which is rich in animal proteins, high levels of homocysteine gives you a four times higher risk of Alzheimer's and it gives you a 64% increase in the risk of hearing loss. So if you increase your leafy green vegetables, your hearing loss risk goes down and your Alzheimer's risk goes down, the more leafy green vegetables you eat. And then the more animal proteins you eat, your hearing loss goes up and your Alzheimer's risk goes up. So you can see that if you decrease your animal proteins and increase your leafy green vegetables, you're immediately lowering, double as a double impact, lowering your disease risk and dramatically increasing uh, your health and longevity. So heart disease is the same thing. We know that the first reported case was in 1912. And in 1920, Dr. Paul White spent 10 years looking for anyone throughout the UK with heart disease. He found three people. He looked for 10 years in 1920. So we know that heart disease was very low in the early 1900s. And then there was this explosion, of course. And a lot of that's to do with, of course, uh, white flour and taking away fibre from our diet as well. But the 2010 Nottingham University study from 368 general practices, this is standard medical practices on 2 million people, found that heart drugs had a 2.7 success rate in lowering heart disease. So in terms of looking at two million people taking heart drugs, the success rate was less than 3%. So less than three people out of 100 were getting success or getting a, a, a result. Here's the other thing, they had a 5% serious side effects rate. So the people that were taking them were getting 
less than 3% success, but 5% side effects. And these side effects, of course, included kidney failure and liver dysfunction. And liver, of course, is one of the most important organs you need to stay healthy and live long. So heart surgery or heart drugs do not cure or prevent heart disease or heart attacks. So we do know something that does, and it's a plant-based whole food diet. And it's more effective than any drugs that we know of around the world. So when we start to look at that, we go, well, human beings are born with cholesterol level of 1.5. That's what we're born with. And in rural China, on a plant-based whole food diet, it stays at 1.5 for their entire life. Now, the interesting thing is their heart disease rates are infinitesimal compared to ours. And their cholesterol levels stay exactly the same as what a human being is born with. In New Zealand, we have about 50% of our population with a blood cholesterol level of 5.6. So you look at one group of people that are not getting heart disease, and they have the same blood cholesterol level their whole life. And you look at another group eating lots and lots of sugary-rich foods and animal products with this massive high level of uh, blood cholesterol levels. And of course, four out of every 10 deaths in New Zealand is preventable heart disease. So is there a connection? Of course. New Zealand diets, Australian diets, the UK diets, American diets have 10 times the animal protein levels three times the dairy fat levels and less than a third of the healthy fiber intake of the rural Chinese. And one in every 12 New Zealand adults is on cholesterol medication. One in 12, it's probably at one in 10 by now. The information on one in 12 is about two years old now, so it's probably up to one in 10. I know an enormous amount of people on heart medications. So heart disease and diet. If we look at the heart disease rates, we look at America, Finland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, they're at number five, United Kingdom, and of course these are the four where you see them everywhere. United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia, and the US. These are the four countries that are in the top 10 list of just about everything. Germany, Sweden, Austria, and Switzerland. These are the countries with the highest levels of heart disease in the world. So when we look at then the highest levels of animal foods and animal protein intakes, we look at, well, what are those countries? They are USA, Finland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom, Germany, Sweden, Austria, and Switzerland. The exact same countries in the exact same order around the world. So there's not even any change whatsoever. So it's interesting when you start to look at that as well. Heart disease causes, we know that the health of your vascular system, which is your heart and circulatory, your arteries, is determined by your diet and exercise. And diet is the fastest, safest, most primary way to prevent heart disease. And the reason I keep going on about heart disease is that so many people in New Zealand die from heart disease, the number one cause of death by such a long shot. And every one of you will know someone who's died of heart disease or know someone with heart disease. That's the sad reality check we have in New Zealand, Australia, the UK and the USA is that we have that. It's very widespread. So how do we know this? Well, we know that diet is the fastest way because 75% of humans on the planet have no heart disease. These are people in rural areas where the majority of the population of the planet is eating a high plant-based, whole food, high fiber diet. And what do they do differently to what we do where we're dying of heart disease? They eat differently. It is the key thing that they do differently is they eat differently. Heart disease in history, even if you go back in history to the 1950s, when there was less processed foods, less rancid starches, cola drinks, trans fats eaten. Even then, with everyone exercising almost every day, there was environmental, less environmental pollution and stress. So all these other things that we know also have an effect on heart disease. Even then, there was less. However, the Western countries that ate the highest levels of animal protein still had the highest heart disease death rates, even when all the other factors were removed. USA, Finland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, UK, Germany, Sweden, Austria, and Switzerland. So even then, it was the same. Didn't matter when you looked at it. So eating better quality meat 50 years ago still had a bigger negative impact on heart disease rates than exercise, processed foods, soft drinks, smoking, or trans fats. It has that much of an impact on heart disease. And all the other things are what we talked about in the media is causing heart disease. So even when you look through history, it's the same. Smoking was not the cause, as Japanese smokers in Japan have far less heart disease than Japanese smokers in America. And the key difference there, of course, is the diet. Now, I'm not advocating smoking. Smoking is the number one cause of death on the planet, so don't smoke. But uh, what we're saying here is in terms of heart disease rates, you can remove, uh, you can change the heart disease rates with smokers or non-smokers based on what they're eating. That's the key thing to take home here. So from 1950 to 2012, over all countries, the higher the level of plant consumption, the lower the levels of heart disease all over the world. Japan, America, UK, you name it, Austria, all the different countries, it's always the same. And as you can see, I'm bringing up all the study references at the bottom of the page. So hypertension and heart disease. I talked about this when we were fasting, but hypertension-related disease is the biggest cause of heart disease death. And Dr. Alan Goldhammer treated 174 consecutive hypertensive patients with a plant-based whole food diet and fasting for a month. All who started on medication were able to give up all the medication, so 100% success. Now the key thing to remember here is when you talk about hypertension, hypertension is high blood pressure. 
High blood pressure is the biggest cause of heart disease. Key things that we know that raise hypertension or high blood pressure, coffee and meat and alcohol. So key things that will raise your high blood pressure and cigarette smoking as well. So meat is one of those key things that's so common in society these days. And of course, high blood pressure now is so rife. And it's the biggest cause of the death in New Zealand is high blood pressure. 90% achieved blood pressure less than 140 over 90, and after six months, the average tested was 123 over 77. This is essentially curing people of high blood pressure, which is essentially wiping out their risk for heart disease. So you can see the direct relationship between plants. And this is the key thing that he did. 174 consecutive patients, didn't matter their blood type, didn't matter their body size, didn't matter their race, their ethnicity, none of that mattered. What mattered was what he did with their diet. Regular fasting, change of diet, off the meat, wham, you wipe out high blood pressure biggest cause of death. So Dr. Alan Goldhammer, uh, Dr. Esselstein, Dr. Robert O. Young, Dr. Dean Ornish, they all have a 90 to 100% success rates at curing or reversing hypertension and heart disease. These are people that have the most successful rates at treating this anywhere in the world, far more successful than any, any drugs. We know that drugs have about a 2.5% success rate, whereas some of these people are getting 90 to 100% success rates. We've had people in our program the same kind of success rates, my mum included where we've actually managed to reverse all the medications and get her off all the drugs. What is the one shared commonality these doctors all have? They all have slightly different versions. They all have slightly different versions of what they recommend. Some recommend you can have some oil, some don't. Some recommend you can have a little bit of dairy products, some don't. Some recommend you should water fast, some don't. But they all have one thing in common. The one single thing that unites all these doctors from all these different places is their patients all go on to a plant-based whole food diet, no meat. It is a one commonality when you're curing heart disease. And given it's the biggest killer of Kiwis, something that I'd recommend. This chart here, again from Forks and Knives, shows liver cancer in rats and protein concentrations. And what we've got here is animal protein being fed to rats with cancer. And when they start to give them 20% higher levels of, or when they give them animal protein, their cancer rates go through the roof. Whereas on plant-based protein, it stays very, very low. So they can directly influence the cancer growth, and then when they take the animal protein out of their diet, it immediately drops back down to 5%. So they can literally feed the cancer growth or turn it off, and feed it and turn it off, just by adjusting the amount of animal protein that these rats are eating. And these are the same rats given liver-causing, uh, cancer-causing chemicals in their diet. So really interesting stuff. So PAH, grilled meat contains one of the most potent carcinogens known. It's called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, but we're going to call it PAR, just to make it easier. Uh, what happens is when fire touches the meat, and of course this is when you really start to go, oh dear, when you start to realise the barbecuing in New Zealand, this massive barbecue culture in New Zealand and Australia where we're all just getting decimated by heart disease. The fat liquefies, when fire directly touches meat, the fat liquefies, drips into the fire, and then this vaporises into par-containing flames. So these par-containing flames then raise, create gas, which then sticks onto the meat, and they reattach to the meat. The most, one of the most carcinogenic things we know of. PAR is used by scientists when they want to create cancer in an animal. So when you're doing an animal experiment and you want to create cancer in an animal, you inject them with PAR. Now here's the weird thing. We choose to eat PAR. Whereas scientists, when they want to create cancer really quickly in an animal, will directly inject them with PAR. But we eat it. It's extraordinary when you think about it. So this is what they use to create uh, cancer in animals in scientific experiments. Contains a red pigment called hame, which can produce chemicals uh, which we call NOx. And NOx, when eaten, form some of the most highly carcinogenic chemical compounds ever recorded in history. And this is, of course, what we eat when we're having a barbecue. So NOx directly promote all cancers throughout the body. That's what NOx do, and NOx directly come off barbecued meat when the gas gets reattached to the meat. That's where it comes from. So meat equals HCA plus FIP plus cancer equals cancer. And these are HCAs are a family of about 17 mutagenic cancer-causing compounds that are produced during any cooking of meat, and they raise cancer risk by about two and a half times and bladder cancer risk by about five times. They're often distributed to the mammary gland, inducing breast cancer. We know that huge links with breast cancer and meat intake, which will go on at the end of the presentation. And FIP is another highly dangerous compound, which is known to cause cancer for more than a decade, and a meat is the highest cause of FIP. Meat also equals advanced glycation compounds. And the longer and the hotter that you cook a meat, the more FIP is present, the more cancerous compounds form. Any cooked animal foods create AGEs, which I mentioned. They're toxic chemicals which harm the immune system. 
which contributed to hardening of the arteries, which is a no-brainer, obviously, when you look at heart disease, because the hardening of the arteries is one of those things that leads us to heart disease, arteriosclerosis, diabetes, arthritis, and it damages collagen, causing skin problems. So again, it starts to age you a lot quicker, because if you want youthful skin, you need lots of collagen. Collagen gets destroyed by too much animal protein, so that's how you wipe out your collagen starts to get wrinkles. So what about chicken? We're eating now 10 times more chicken than we were in the 60s. What about chicken? Isn't chicken good? White meat, that's better, right? Well, is chicken any better? Unfortunately, no, it's not. Chicken actually forms higher FIP and higher HCAs than red meat does. So it's actually got more carcinogenic chemicals in it than red meat. So unfortunately, it's not as good, right? So I know this is the part of the seminar that no one likes, believe me. So how about lean meats or chicken without the skins on? Well, the leanest beef available is still 29% saturated fat, even with the fat chopped off. And chicken, even with the skin removed, is 23% saturated fat. And that is before any cooking, any frying, any butter, any oil, any rancid starches that it gets fried in. Before all that, you're still looking at 23 to 30% saturated fat. So is it any better? No. Chicken's actually worse. Camelobacter is endemic in chicken's guts. What happens is commercially grown chickens are killed and then often rinsed in chlorine-based uh, chlorinated water or a cocktail of chemical to keep them sterile. However, this is, uh, the idea behind this is this keeps the bad bacteria down. It kills the bad bacteria off. But unfortunately, it does not work. How do we know that? Well, New Zealand has about 10,000 food poisoning cases reported every year. It's about 20 every single day. Most of them are to do with chicken. And most of that chicken's been chlorine rinsed. So if we are rinsing our chickens in this toxic chemical, and yet people are still getting food poisoning from the, the fallout of the chicken, which is supposed to be killed by the chlorine in the first place, you're getting a double whammy. You're getting chlorine as well as the bacteria. So does it work? No, it doesn't. Chicken equals food poisoning. In America, they're eating about a million chickens every hour now in the States. So they're going through the most extraordinary amount of chickens every hour. And of course, that's primarily through the fast food chains, your KFCs and your chicken, uh, your McDonald's and all those kind of places. A million chickens every hour. Here's the funny thing. There's only four suppliers to the food chain. So four suppliers supply 250,000 chickens every hour, 24-7, 52 weeks a year in America. How do you grow 250,000 chickens an hour? It's completely, it's beyond belief, you know, when you think about it. 76 million Americans get food poisoning every year. So if 76, 76 million Americans get food poisoning and they chlorine rinse their chickens, over 1.5 million people get food poisoning every day, if you just do the simple maths. 66% of tested store-bought US chickens uh, were contaminated with bacteria. These are bought chickens at retail. And in New Zealand, they did the same thing in 2010 in a random sample picked and tested by the New Zealand Herald as published, 70% of the store-bought chickens tested positive for camelobacter. 70% random New Zealand two years ago by the New Zealand Herald. That's how, how widespread it is, and that's how hard it is to get rid of. What about eggs? Well, as you know, there's only one eggs that only one sort of eggs I recommend. That's genuine free-range eggs. And there's a real crucial thing to remember here, because the chickens can roam and move around whenever they like. Why is that important? They need exercise to work their muscles, and they need to get vitamin D. They're free to run about under sunlight. It's very important the chickens get the vitamin D in their feathers. They then go into the eggs, and you get much better quality eggs. That's why you see the much, much more yellow yolks when you go out into the country and you get eggs that have been you know, grown, apart from if they've got additives to them and things, which you want to avoid. Uh, they also eat bugs and grass and seeds and green plants and insects and worms, and that's what chickens naturally live on not refined grains. If you're eating refined grains, of course, you'll have high levels of omega-6 and very low levels of omega-3. And human beings are about 1 to 20 out. We should be eating about the same amount of omega-3s and 6s. We're eating about 1 part omega-3 to six parts, uh, 20 parts of omega-6. So we're completely out of whack. Now, how do you bring that back? If you're eating eggs, you must have free-range chickens that are walking around out in the sunlight eating bugs and grass because that's how they grow their omega-3. They lay their eggs all over the place. And this is not true of about 90% of the eggs sold in New Zealand. So most eggs in New Zealand, of course, are not this. So one great thing to do is to make sure you're eating free-range eggs. If you're going to eat eggs, then eat free-range eggs. Uh, and we find that in terms of the science, it seems to be that as long as you're eating less than 5% of your total intake of animal fruits, is about 5% of your diet, then you've got about the same longevity uh, risk and disease risks as vegetarians. So if you're having, say, a couple of meals a week of eggs or a couple of th maybe two or three meals a week of fish, you've got about the same level of disease risk as a vegetarian, which is great. So you can have a few small meals, and that's when you look at those rural Chinese, they'll catch some fresh fish, or they'll get some free-range eggs. So 
You can actually have small amounts of this and still have the same disease risk if you want it. There's virtually no bowel disease in rural Africa. I never saw one patient in 20 years of surgical practice. This is Dr. Dennis Burkett, who spent 25 years in Africa treating people. Over 90% of all chronic diseases are due to infection of the gastrointestinal tract. One of the ways you do that, of course, is eating chicken. And this is from the Royal Society of Medicine in the UK. It takes about 15 years from the first bowel cancer initiating DNA damage to full-blown bowel cancer. So the earlier we improve our diets, the better. Now, this is fascinating. And this is from the Journal of Nutrition only a matter of weeks ago. This is fascinating because finally mainstream medical science is starting to talk about it takes a long time to grow these diseases. You don't wake up with a heart attack. You don't wake up with bowel cancer. It actually grows in the human body over a long period of time. How do you grow bowel cancer? By eating too much meat and refined sugar over a long period of time. Now we know it takes about 15 years to grow. And we know New Zealand women have the highest rates of bowel cancer of any group of women on the planet. New Zealand men have the third highest rates of bowel cancer of any group of men on the planet. So we're number one and number three on planet Earth for bowel cancer in New Zealand. We also have one of the highest intakes of meat on the planet. And we know there's a direct relationship between the two. So should we do something about it? Of course. New Zealand has massive rates of diverticulitis, over 15,000 Kiwis with Crohn's disease. That is one of the highest rates on planet Earth, by the way, Crohn's disease, and the highest rates of bowel cancer on planet Earth. And the biggest cause of all bowel diseases and all bowel cancer is a long-term lack of fibre in the diet. We've been grown up on this low-fibre diet. Now, fibre is only found in plant whole foods, which, of course, is what we base the entire programme around. Meat has no fibre, so the more meat you eat, the higher your chances of bowel cancer and bowel disease. It's that simple. Meat displaces fibre in your diet. The less fibre you have, the higher the risk. If you look at Africans versus Africans, for example, and we have some Africans in the room this evening, <laughs> So bowel diseases are non-existent among fit rural Africans living on a natural plant-based high-fiber diet and squatting when they go to the bathroom. <coughs> so we know it's non-existent. However, if you take those Africans, move them to American, call them American Africans, right? then they're uh, on an animal-rich diet, low-fiber diet, massive and varied bowel diseases. As soon as they start to eat the American diet, which of course is animal-rich and low-fiber, they start to get the bowel disease. The same thing with Asians. Asian rural areas were studied. They showed exactly the same result. No bowel disease present when living on a natural plant-based high-fiber diet and squatting. But when Asian people moved to a Western sedentary culture, just as the Japanese woman did at the end of the Second World War, to an animal-rich, protein-rich diet, then bowel disease becomes rampant. And one of those key drivers of that, of course, is the meat. The Czech eat a low-fiber, meat-rich diet, and their colon cancer rates are 34 per 100,000. Rural Indians eat a high-fiber, plant-based diet, and their colon cancer rates are 0 0.63 per 100,000. So when you're talking about cancer rates, the Czech men living on the modern low-fiber meat-based diet have 54 times the colon cancer rate of Indian men living on a high-fiber plant-based whole food diet. Now the funny thing is there's 1.2 billion Indians and there's 10 million Czech Republicans. So you've got 120 times more people, but over here you've got 54 times more bowel cancer. And what is the one thing that changes? The diet. So nothing to do with uh, population base at all all to do with per capita, to do with intake. So bowel cancer causes, the liver makes bile to absorb the fat, which is stored in your gallbladder, which is why you don't want to have your gallbladder cut out. After eating, the gallbladder sends bile acids into your intestine to change and absorb your fats. And bacteria from meat in the intestine, as we're talking about from meat or from chicken, with a bad intestinal bacteria, can turn bile acids into carcinogenic secondary bile acids, and this can lead to colon cancer. So that's another way that the body causes colon cancer and bowel cancer from meat. So animals split into two groups. There was two groups of animals split into two groups. Sorry, I'll say that again. There was one group of animals split into two groups. Uh, and one was fed a meat-based diet. The, by, by the way, both of these animals were injected, again, with carcinogenic material, probably PAH from meat. They were injected with carcinogenic material to create cancer. So these animals were given cancer. The animals that were given the uh, cancer-causing chemicals were fed the modern animal-rich diet. Within weeks, 90% had breast cancer and 60% had liver cancer. So animals injected with these chemicals on a meat-based diet were sick within weeks. Animals fed the same cancer-causing chemicals but eating a plant-based whole food diet developed no cancer of any sort. These were the same groups of animals given the same cancer-causing chemicals did not develop cancer. Split into two groups. So very interesting to see what happens on a plant-based diet rather than a whole food-based diet. So meat and colon cancer. Meat is more closely associated with colon and bowel cancer than any other single factor. We know that from study after study after study. Meat massively influences and increases your colon cancer risk. 
Women eating meat have a 250% increased risk of colon cancer over women that don't. Eating meat daily triples your colon cancer risk compared to vegetarians. And colon cancer survivors, so you get over colon cancer, you're free of it. But if you eat a heavy meat diet after that, you're triple the risk of dying from colon cancer again. Eating, triple, uh, eating chicken triples your risk as well compared to vegetarians. So meat and breast cancer, we know this again, very, very closely linked. Regular meat consumption, regardless of what else you eat, doesn't matter what else you eat, if you're regularly eating meat, increases your breast cancer risk. Women eating red meat regularly have a 50% higher risk of breast cancer, and eating meat daily, and your breast cancer risk rises by about 200%. Animal fat and high fat dairy products are also closely linked with increased risk of breast cancer. And uh, Japanese women, for instance, uh, one, have an eight times higher risk Japanese woman eating meat than the Japanese vegetarian woman, even in the same area. So not to do with genetics either. So what about kidney disease? We know kidney disease and high blood pressure go together very well. Eating meat gives you uh, a much higher risk of developing kidney stones and kidney cancer. And animal protein intake is the biggest and most influential precursor to kidney stones, creating excessive calcium, uh, calcium and oxalate in the kidneys. At least 31% of middle-aged Kiwis, anyone over the age of about 40, has already got a loss of uh, kidney function. And the higher the intake of animal protein, the higher the incidence of kidney stones. Women with mild kidney damage, though, can reverse that by going onto a vegetarian diet or a plant-based whole food diet. So you can reverse your, your kidney damage if you want to. And of course, you can dramatically lower your blood pressure. So what about meat and all disease? Here's a bit of a summary. Well, women eating meat have a 68% higher risk of stroke. Women eating red meat regularly have a 50% higher risk of death by heart disease. Eating over 100 grams of meat a day, which is only a small amount, triples your risk of stomach cancer. Eating red meat regularly almost triples your risk of prostate cancer, which is dramatically growing in men around the Western world. There's a 500% in prostate cancer in the last 15 years alone. It's extraordinary, just like breast cancer with women. Eating meat daily dramatically increases vision loss and the risk of blindness and cataracts. And a diet high in meat and animal fats increases pancreatic cancer risk by 53%. And eating animal foods helps toxins and food poisoning pathogens stay in the human body. That obviously is a no-brainer given what chicken uh, bacteria does to the human body. So, corned beef and Pacifica. This is one of those sad stories. Meat in Tonga comes in paint-sized tins. A processed turkey, breast, meatloaf, luncheon meat, corned beef or spam. And sadly, when you look at the uh, rates of obesity in the fattest nations in the world, eight now out of the top ten are Pacific Island countries. So we've got this devastation of diabetes and obesity uh, in the uh, Pacific Island countries. More than 90% of the Tongan, Tongan population now is classified as overweight, and more than 60% is obese, and we're heading the same way in New Zealand, of course. Pacific Island nations, I've said that, account for eight of the top 10 countries where the male population is overweight or obese. And life expectancy is now in the 60s in Tonga, where it used to be much, much higher. So that the the longevity rate is dropping. And what do we do? We send them paint-sized tins of the worst kind of processed meat. Death usually comes from preventable heart disease and diabetes. I read an interview with one of the health officials on Tonga about a year ago, and he was heartbroken because it's so common in Tonga to see funerals. They happen every day. It's just so common, happening all the time. And he said, I see it every day, and it's all preventable, all preventable disease. It's not because you're getting hit by a car. It's actually the kind of disease that grows in the human body. So we're not serving our nations, any, uh, our neighbours at all well. One average sausage, for those people that like to eat a sausage, let me just break down what a sausage is for those that would like to have a nibble, particularly when you think about school fundraising, which I refuse to be a part of, by the way. <laughs> uh, average sausage contains about 20 grams of pure fat and 50% of a mixture of various dubious meats from different animals. So you get a whole lot of the waste meats, you blend it all together in this pink slime, Add 20 grams of pure fat, and then you add extenders, sterilizers, additives, and flavorings, and around 1,000 milligrams, one gram of pure sodium, which is salt, of course, which none of us need any more of. And this is all before it gets fried. So this is all the ingredients when it's raw, before you then deep fry it and create a whole lot of more trans fats with it. Sausages, hamburgers, and pies are the worst ways to eat meat. Absolutely the worst. You can add to that, of course, pizza, but they are the four killers. Pies, sausages, hamburgers, and pizza. Processed meat kills you, doubles diabetes risk, it doubles stomach cancer, raises heart disease by 50%, colon cancer by 60%, lung cancer, lung disease by 93%, bladder cancer by 250%, triples brain tumor risk in children, raises childhood asthma risk by 75%, raises your risk of all early death by 30%, 
So if you want to die young, eat lots of meat, processed meat. And 50% of charcoal grilled meat has twice as much carcinogenic uh, benzoprine as 300 cigarettes. So if you want to eat a whole lot of char grilled meat, you actually may as well smoke 300 cigarettes. You get the same amount of carcinogenic benzoprine. Benzoprine, sorry. So yeah, really sad stuff when you look at processed meat. So this is the kind of meat you want to avoid uh, more than just about anything else. If you're going to give up your meat, that's the kind of stuff you need to avoid. The 2011 World Cancer Research Fund uh, is the result of a five-year process by an international panel of the world's leading scientists. What they did was they got together and they looked at all the different studies on diet and cancer that have been done in history. So they looked at all the British, the American, the UK, New Zealand, Australian, all the different studies that have been done on cancer and diet throughout history. And they said, well, look, let's have a look at them. It's the biggest review of cancer evidence ever done. It was first done in 2003, then done, sorry, 2000, yeah, 2003, then it was done five years again, uh, and then confirmed again in 2011. Uh, and it was funded using money from the general public. This is the interesting thing. So it was funded using money that has no vested interests in the result. So it was, here's a whole lot of money, independent scientists are being paid to look together at what is the connection between diet and cancer. So no vested interests. They looked at all the studies and they said, okay, let's have a look at this. So they had a really good look. What was the basic summary? And by the way, this was peer-reviewed twice by independent scientists that all came to the exact same conclusion because it was that black and white. The basic summary for these independent scientists had the same thing. Remember, this is the biggest summary on diet and cancer ever done in history. Processed meats increase your risk of all cancer, especially bowel cancer. No surprise there, given what New Zealand eats and then the bowel cancer rates that New Zealand has. No amount of processed meat is safe for human health. What an extraordinary statement when you think about it, considering what New Zealand eats every day with pies, sausages, hamburgers, uh, you know, pizzas, all these different kind of things. I'll say this one again. No amount of processed meat is safe for human health. This is what they said, and I'm quoting it directly. Number three, the more meat you eat, the more heart disease, strokes, heart attacks, cancer, and coronary problems you will suffer. So if you want heart disease, eat your meat. There is no sane scientific or other reason for eating animal protein. From Dr. Robert O. Young, for those that have read any of his pH miracle uh, results. Do we need to eat meat? No. Plants contain abundant levels of protein, vitamin C, antioxidants, fiber, iron, calcium, carbohydrates, and good fats. Plants have no cholesterol and no saturated fat, apart coconut, of course, because saturated fat, you know what, what it is because it gets hard at room temperature as opposed to uh, is liquid at room temperature. So coconut, bar and coconut, but it's a very different sort of saturated fat, by the way. Plants keep our entire digestive system fully charged, working regular and clean. Of course, this is what runs your immune system. Your immune system is what runs your liver and what keeps you healthy and gives you a long, healthy life. Plants are anti-cancer, anti-aging, anti-heart disease, anti-osteoporosis, and highly alkaline. So, as we start to get into some summaries tonight, eating meat increases heart disease, colon cancer, constipation, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, known as high blood pressure, strokes, breast and lung cancer, liver and, kidney, liver and kidney cancer, and all digestive disorders. Eating meat exposes you to high salt intake, high calorie intake, trans fats, high saturated fat, chemicals, HCAs, PAH, AGEs, FIP, NOx, hormones, antibiotics, pesticides, herbicides, and unlabeled meat glue, known as transglutaminase. This is why I don't recommend you eat meat. It's a very, very simple process when you start to look at it. So being a vegetarian or eating a plant-based whole food diet lowers incidence of constipation, digestive disorders, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, arthritis, hypertension, pain, inflammation, gout, and all cancers. And being a vegetarian or eating a plant-based whole food diet exposes you to plant oxidants, carotenoids, chlorophyll, vitamin C complex, polyphenols, fibers of all different sorts, absorbable minerals, absorbable vitamins, alkaline foods, and longevity nutrients. So again, you start to see very, very classic case of why would I be a vegetarian? Why would I eat a plant-based diet? A healthy plant-based diet protects against all disease. One serving of leafy green vegetables daily will lower your heart disease risk by 40%. And of course, we know that now our intake of leafy green vegetables is about 2%. A typical kiwi intake in the Western world is 2%. We need to be eating about 40%. So we need this dramatic increase. It's one of the reasons I say, look, for lunch and dinner, make sure you've got greens on your plate. It doesn't matter what kind of variety, but eat more greens for lunch and dinner because they will dramatically lower your risk of disease. 
lowers cancer risk by 50%, stroke risk by 42%, lowers eyesight degeneration risk by 65% because carotenoids, of course, which are those wonderful colours in nature, the, uh, the orange beta-carotenes and carrots, the red anthocyanins and berries, uh, you've got your, um, your vitamin C complexes, of course, you've got your, um, uh, your allicins and garlics and things like that, you've got your, uh, what are the other carotenoids, my mind's gone blank, chlorophyll, things like that, all those different colours in nature. They are what sit in the macula of the eye. That's where the carotenoids are often stored in the body. So they're our antioxidant protection that run our immune system, as well as they get packed into the eye, which is why they decrease macular degeneration, which is why you need more of the different coloured fruits and vegetables. Also, plant-based diet lowers type 2 diabetes by about 83%, Alzheimer's by about 68%, prevents about 75% of heart attacks, which is why we know those countries around the world, 75% of the nations around the world, the, the population never get a heart attack because they're, of course, eating a whole food plant-based diet. Leads to permanent weight loss. Strengthens your bones, protects against uh, bone loss and reduces calcium loss and feeds the body B vitamins. Where do you get B vitamins from? Your leafy green vegetables. How do we know that? Folate. Of course, folate comes from the old word for foliage. Foliage is where we get the folates and the B vitamins. So always remember, if you're worried about your folates, your B vitamins, go for your foliage. Foliage is the big leafy green blossoms that we don't eat enough of. So vegetarian leaders, I thought I'd put up an interesting little summary there before we finish up on what are the vegetarian leaders in history? Who are they? Well, you've got some really influential people, people like Buddha, Plato, Jesus, Einstein, Pythagoras, Socrates, Benjamin Franklin, some of the most amazing people in history were vegetarians. Sir Isaac Newton, what a brain. What about Gandhi? What about Henry Ford? Started an entire industry. You know, H.G. Wells created half the science fiction that my good man here and myself enjoy so thoroughly, science fiction freaks. What a great brain. Maximilian and Bircher Benner, of course, invented the Bircher muesli. So some of the smartest people in the world, and of course, one of the greatest recent American politicians, Bill Clinton, has recently gone onto a plant-based diet a few years ago, and of course dropped a massive amount of weight, and now is a spokesman for plant-based diets, because it's had such an impact on him. He was basically dying of heart disease. And the joke with him was, whenever they went out on anything presidential, you'd always have to stop at the fast food place on the way back to the White House. It was this common you know, joke among the security service of America. And now, of course, it doesn't happen. So five reasons to eat meat. For those people that want to eat meat, remember, it tastes good. Meat tastes good, so there's one reason. Number two, it makes you feel good for a short period of time. It's a great tradition. It's a great tradition. It supports the nation's farmers. It's another good reason. And number five, your parents did it. These are five good reasons, right? Oh, sorry, there are five reasons to smoke cigarettes. Sorry, that's the wrong reasons. Let me just remove that. <laughs> it's quite a fascinating article a guy did about the reasons to smoke cigarettes, and there actually aren't any. So the benefits of a meat-based diet, if you really want to look at it, is a good source of vitamin A. No question about it. Meat is a very good source of vitamin A. Unfortunately, our livers uh, cannot detoxify high levels of vitamin A. So not so good after all. <laughs> so meanwhile in Korea... Very important to make sure that if you want to eat animals, that you should eat all animals. And of course, we kind of have this weird thing in the West where we go, dogs and cats are really nice, but chicken and pigs and cows, we should eat them. It's kind of a very unusual thing, you know, when you start to consider why do we distinguish certain animals. If you're going to eat them, eat all of them. So, you know, go to the local park, get a dog and throw them in a pot, have some nice dog. You know? So the benefits of a plant-based whole food diet, a healthier, longer life, a far lower risk of all disease. Now, I could make this into a huge list, but I've just put up the big ones. Stomach cancer, bowel cancer, breast cancer, obesity, osteoporosis, arthritis, mental and cognitive decline, all the things that we don't want. The best source of supernutrition, sustainable weight loss, of course, an ethical coexistence with animals from a moral perspective, and supporting healthier environments for our children and our children's children. We know that plant-based diets, of course, massively decrease the waste on the planet. And, of course, the cost and the use of fuel and all those environmental things. I could do two hours on that alone, but that's a whole other angle. And it's just, you know, in a different place. So, again, I wanted to summarise up with this one favourite study uh, review, which is a vegetarian diet can prevent 97% of our coronary occlusions. That is heart problems. Now, that was said by mainstream American science in the AMA Medical Association editorial in 1961. So this was known by mainstream doctors 50 years ago. 97%, that's a lot of coronary occlusions. A plant-based whole food diet follows all the basic religious and philosophical teachings throughout history. So it doesn't matter what faith you belong to or philosophical basis or religious background, there's always the four basic tenets that they all teach. Number one is protect and revere the human body. Number two is to feed the poor. 
Number three is to safeguard humanity and protect our children. And number four is to respect the environment. And those four things are all followed by a plant-based whole food diet. So this is why I do not recommend you eat meat. The end. Thank <laughs> you.